Hey everybody, welcome. Thank you for coming. We are thrilled to have you here. So I'm Mike Wood. This is the other co-president of Out in Morningstar, Michael Leung. Take a bow. Take a bow. <laughs> um, so one, we are thrilled to have you guys here. We also mildly shocked. Uh, so we love to talk about what to do best for investors all day. It is great that you guys all want to be a part of the conversation as well. So thank you for being here. So investing for quality has been a topic that our group has been interested in since we started the group a year ago. And as we did research, we realized that there's a real opportunity for Morningstar to lend a voice to this, to this discussion in its infancy. And it's through this research that we found the good work that Trillium Asset Management has been doing in this space. And this is why I invited Matt to be part of the panel as well. Thank, Thank you, Matt. You, Matt. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing we talked about when this conversation did start was, right, boycotts have been a part of the LGBT kind of community's ability to raise their voice. But it always felt a little reactive. So when we are thinking about the way money moves and capital flows, it gives us a chance to do something that we almost consider a proactive protest. So we're really happy to welcome you here to the space tonight. So in the past year, we've been engaging with the community, with your business groups, and we're really excited to offer even more quality programming to the community in the next year. So please come talk to me or Mike after the event, and we could brainstorm for ideas for collaboration as well. So said differently, we hope to see you here again. <laughs> <laughs> it's an awful space, we know. Um, all right, so real quick, a few quick thank yous. First and foremost, we would love to thank David Williams. He is our executive sponsor of Out in Morningstar. He is our tireless champion. He backs every crazy idea we come up with, and even the good ones. Um, we would like to thank a bunch of people in this room from Morningstar who've done a lot of work. Our comms team, our events team, our media team, our design team, our HR team. Uh, it takes a village to get this going at times, so thank you to everyone. Uh, also, quick shout out to Out and Equal. They help promote the event, so we're very excited to have everyone here. Uh, one quick note. So after this, we are going to do a second reception. It will be that way. Uh, if you need anything, look for somebody with a rainbow flag, which if I had a nickel for every time I thought that, <laughs> I would invest it wisely. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to show, I'm going to show myself out, and I'm going to turn it over to our Morningstar.com editor, Jeremy Glazier. Thanks, Michael, Michael, and Matt uh, Patsky, who's the CEO of uh, Trillium Asset Management. Thank you for being here. And uh, John Hale, too. He's our head of sustainable research. I think we're going to have a broad-ranging conversation today kind of about the state of sustainable investing, the state of investing uh, with impact to put your dollars to work uh, to really uh, be in line with your values. Uh, give a little bit of the state of where we are and talk about how to actually get this done or work with your advisor to get it done. And uh, we want to take plenty of questions, so I think there'll be some people floating around with microphones uh, a little bit later. Uh, I see one right here, uh, so we'll be able to take those. Uh, so I just wanted to start with a map uh, that Matt passed on to us um, about the uh, LGBT equality policy tally here in the U.S. Um, just to kind of get a sense of uh, that there's still progress to be made. So Matt, I know that's something you're uh, passionate about. Uh, can you talk a little bit about why this is still important? Uh, sure, yeah. I mean, one of the, um, I would say, misunderstandings that certainly we, we all in the LGBT community are painfully aware of is people perceived when we won the right to marriage at the Supreme Court that the issue was done. And if you work with any gay rights groups, they will tell you they actually started to lose corporate funding because people at the corporations and the in the foundation side started to think that, that this issue was done. We have um, not won equality, um, and we know certainly from looking at the civil rights movement that equality will not be won just because it's illegal to discriminate against us. So it is a long haul fight for equality. Uh, in most states in the United States, it is still okay, it's perfectly legal, to terminate someone for being LGBT it is also perfectly legal to deny them housing. So there are many cases, and you've certainly read about them, of people who have decided to go ahead and get married, and on you know, Saturday they have got married, and they lost their jobs on Monday. And then you know, later they've lost their homes because their landlord has decided they don't rent to people who are gay. So 
Uh, we've got a long battle ahead, and one of the, you know, when you look at the LGBT rights movement, it was largely won because of corporate America. It was largely corporations who stepped out ahead of public opinion and municipal and state law and gave us rights. The rights we started to win in, you know, with LGBT protections in the non-discrimination clauses um, made it comfortable to come out, made us more visible, and then ultimately public opinion swung to making it possible to win in municipal and state battles. But I think for, for uh, most of you in the room are very young. But there, you know, I, I remember marching on City Hall in New York City in 1987 trying to get the city of New York to put in protections on employment and housing and the opposition we faced. And it's just sort of amazing how much progress we've made but we have to remember most of the country are living in there. I mean, not most of the country, because the population centers have generally moved where we're going, you know, to, to being supportive. But there are plenty of people in the LGBT community living in fear because they do not have any protections. So, yeah. John, I think Matt just laid out the case for it, but why should this be done in the investment realm? Uh, you know, should it be more uh, a political action? Is it a social action? Um, do you think it's, it's reasonable to also have your investments align? You know, people usually think of money as this kind of separate bucket of their life that, that doesn't maybe interact with those, those other parts. Yeah, I think the, the, the key thing to, to keep in mind is that like, it's perfectly normal to want to uh, express these kinds of concerns in your investment life. We tend to, um, you know, with investments, try to get people to, to be, you know, sort of more rational than, in some sense, than they need to be. That, that, that the idea with investing is that you have to put, you know, your values aside so that you can invest and kind of get this utilitarian benefit of, of maximizing your financial return with your investments. But, um, you know, sort of, you know, normal everyday people have all kinds of, um, you know, sort of values that they bring into their investments. And um, so, you know, on that basis alone, I think it's, it's, you should consider it to be something perfectly normal. You, you know, whether it's, whether it's uh, LGBT issues, whether it's, whether it's broader sort of environmental issues or sort of corporate responsibility issues that you'd like to see, uh, that you'd like to express in your investments. This is all something that is perfectly normal for someone to, to be able to want to do. And, and increasingly, I think the um, investment world is making it easier uh, for people to do that. So we can Yeah, what kind of shift are we seeing there? I, I know, uh, you know, when I started in this industry, socially responsible investing SRI, now it's ESG, uh, looking at environmental social governance factors. Um, is that just a change of name that, that we're using, or is there really a change in the way that the companies are providing products to, to target some of these, these issues? Well, I think, you know, I don't know how many out there have even heard the term socially responsible investing. It was kind of, if we had been here, what, Matt, 10, 15 years ago, we would have been talking about SRI, and, and, and um, it would have been a, probably a smaller group here than, than, yeah. than this. Um, but, it, you know, it's a field that's evolved to become uh, quite a bit more, um, I think, complex and multifaceted than it, than it used to be. Um, and uh, one that, yes, there's a lot more opportunity to invest um, with the idea of like with these different issues that kind of fall under the rubric of sustainable investing or um, responsible investing, impact investing right. uh, today than there, than there uh, was 10, 15 years ago. There's about, in just the uh, mutual fund and in, in, um, ETF space in the US right now, there's um, about uh, 200 funds out there that, that do this in some way, shape, or form. About 90 of them are just new in the past uh, three years or so. So it's, we've had a, a huge increase in the amount of options that are out there. So what of those 200, I think just one is uh, focused on LGBT issues? Is that one that's focused, I would say, solely on L yeah. LGBT issues as a sort of thematic approach. Um, you know, it's interesting because it's a it's it's a, it's called um, 
it's, the ticker is L, uh, EQLT, I believe. Um, it's called the Workplace Equality Fund. And the interesting thing about that is that the, this, this small um, uh, advisor in Denver, yep. Denver Advisors, right, is yep. the name of it, um, uh, ha had an L LGBT clientele and um, put together an index of, of companies that, that you know, did well on equality issues, um, started that index uh, some years ago, eventually an ETF was created to track that index, and it's actually done very well in the investment world. So kind of aside from the idea that this might be you know, a, a great option to actually invest in, which we can, we can discuss, but it, it's an interesting proposition because it shows that investing for equality, that's our theme tonight, can, you know, does pay off from a performance standpoint. This fund has a, 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 does very well on a risk-adjusted basis versus hundreds of conventional funds uh, out there, uh, particularly over the last like three and a half years or so. Right. So it just shows that, uh, that uh, in this particular instance of sort of workplace equality and uh, issues that there's no performance penalty to be you know, had necessarily for investing in this way. So let's talk about how you might execute a strategy like this. You, you're looking at your portfolio, maybe you have kind of plain vanilla uh, either index funds or mutual funds and, and, and you want to figure out how you can tilt it towards uh, you know, companies that are, that are doing uh, good. Um, step one is probably just your standard personal finance advice about coming up with your asset allocation. I mean, you're not going to throw out um, you know, those kind of I ideas when you're choosing these funds. You really still need to, to start there. Maybe it's more of a statement than a question. But um, you know, when you are picking those funds, then um, do you decide, do you go very narrow? Do you look at something like the Workplace Equality ETF? Do you look at, I know there's gender lens ETFs, there's climate change funds, um, or is it better to take a more holistic view of the world uh, and find managers and funds that are, are really working across issues? Right. Maybe Matt, if you, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I our philosophy is obviously very <laughs> holistic. Now, um, one of the things I will say, we have a, a, a number of clients who are from the LGBT community, and. I have yet to meet an LGBT client who only cares about LGBT equality. So um, now there may be, and that this may be the perfect solution, right, is to, is to buy this particular index because that's the thing they're screening on. But um, if, if you are a gay man and also a feminist, you may care about gender pay equality. You may care about racial equality. You may care about environmental protection, right? And so incorporating all of those into a more holistic view of the impacts we're having with our money, right? And that's what we really um, do at, at Trillium is try to look at what are the impacts we're having with our money environmentally, socially, and then we're trying to obviously provide for the financial needs by delivering financial returns. And then when these, you know, we talk about, you said mm -hmm. screening, like what, what does that mean? How would a manager, if you're at one of these well, funds, how do they go out and decide that a company is in fact friendly to the LGBT? Yep. We're, we're starting by asking the question of what uh, protections they have in place. And, and of course, uh, you know, just to add a, a, a new, I mean, not that we weren't asking this, but now it's become absolutely critical that we ask this. We ask about reproductive health benefits for their health care plan to make sure that they are not denying women uh, the benefit of, of health care benefits for, um, you know, for um, b both, you know, for they're not denying them um, any, any health care that should be made available based on their family planning. So, I, um, you know, the, the recent statements sort of implying that that's perfectly okay to do under the under because of Hobby Lobby, just the, the Supreme Court decision on Hobby Lobby is is kind of frightening, but um, because it's it's it sort of opens up the door to a lot of other issues. But we we are asking questions about do they have sexual orientation and gender identity in their non discrimination clause, right? And if they do not, we are demanding that they correct that. And so the the other avenue we have for change that we're impact that we have is by asking for change from companies and you see a lot of the activity we do on the corporate engagement side is about getting that behavioral change by getting companies to change policy 
How successful has that been? I, I both there and then I know John, you've yeah. spoken about this recently too. Yeah. I mean, if you were to look through the last, Trillium started asking companies to protect employees based on sexual orientation back in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, it was really, it, it really came out of a, an emotional reaction from the, the founder of Trillium from the AIDS epidemic, right? We were losing our homes uh, because landlords were afraid of us. We were being denied health care and we were dying. And there was no response from government. And she had, uh, I think, very rationally thought companies should be protective of their employees given the, what was happening in society and started asking companies to put protection in, the play, in, in their non-discrimination clauses and, and uh, was very successful. And of course, in, in you know, looking back now, 10 years ago, we realized that was, and I don't want to say done because it wasn't done, but it was largely accomplished with most of the major Fortune 500. And so we went back and started working on gender identity and making sure that transgender rights were protected. And when we did that, I just point out, it was an interesting transition and difference. We almost had no opposition, right? We would make the phone call. We notice you have sexual orientation protection and your non-discrimination, that's great. Best practice is to also include gender identity. And in 90% of the cases, they would say, okay, that's done on the phone call, right? And we would be able to then go back and say, well, we now need to make sure that your health care benefits include benefits for those who are in the transgender community so that there is, um, you know, health care benefits available to them. So that all kind of flowed and I think went, went much smoother. I, I think the, uh, the, the, the numbers are, you know, and, and, my, I, and I think it's 98% now of the Fortune 500 that have protection based on sexual orientation and we're up to... I want to say 75% for gender identity, but we're, we're making it, we're, we're getting to the point where it's kind of a best practice and understood as a best practice. So I think largely that's been, that's, that's happened. Um, we we just, just have to make sure there's no backsliding when we start to see uh, challenges coming from Washington. John, I know a lot of best managers, at least on climate change, has been kind of the hot topic, yeah. at least yeah. with the corporations recently. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think we should like maybe back up back up and broaden this out a little bit. I mean, I think really what we're saying is that if you know you're you're interested in if you're here tonight, you're interested in this theme, investing for equality, and what what Matt said is that you know that generally means you probably have an affinity or a concern about a, a whole sort of range of issues that we often call. Um, sustainability issues or in the in investment parlance ESG issues environmental social and, and corporate governance issues were con you know the idea is that you can invest this way that there are a number of of, of uh, funds out there that allow you to invest that way if you you know have enough uh, money to invest to go to a wealth manager directly you've got even more options in order to do this and the thing is um, you know, these companies that provide the provided benefits or the, especially the early, the early adopters, I mean, you know, what does that say about a company, right? It says it's a, it's a, generally speaking, it says it's a good quality company out there, a company that's probably over the long run going to make a good in, investment. So you're, you're back to this kind of connection between impact on the one hand and, and, and financial success on the other, that there's no sort of real trade-off between the two at all. They're sort of mutually reinforcing. And, and then the other thing that, Matthew, you, you know, really making, made the point well, I thought, that, you know, just let me make it, like, maybe more clear, is that, you know, a, a manager like, like Trillium um, engages with companies that they own on these kinds of issues. So it's a, they play a very important role of, talking to companies and you know sort of calling their attention to some of these issues right. and, and and in many cases you know as Matt said that that you know corporations were a, a major player in in equality right for Absolutely. and and yeah. a lot of times it just took uh, an investor who was concerned about this 
to go to the company and say, let's sit down and have a meeting about this. Why aren't you offering this benefit? And the, in many cases, it's not like the companies are these sort of you know, yeah, you, evil players right. saying like, no, no, take, yep. get away from me. They're saying, okay, we get it. You know, especially yep. if you can say, you know, you're the only, you know, you're in the bottom of your industry and in providing this kind of benefit. And, right. uh, and so it, you can have an incredible amount of impact, I think, per dollar invested in this way. Yep. Do you think traditional asset managers, traditional fund managers who aren't, um, Having this this mandate, it's not explicit. Do you see them becoming more amenable to, to pushing management in this way, or do you really need to go with an intentional fund uh, in order to to get these these kind of benefits? A fund that's saying we're definitely sustainable. Uh, I think it, it's good to have in you know dollars in funds that are really focused on the engagement side of things. I mean the uh, the the way this often works is that, and it happened this year, uh, there were a lot of um, shareholder resolutions to ask companies to disclose their climate risk. You know, so here's companies, uh, you know, huge companies like Exxon Mobil saying, you know, to investors, no, 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 we don't, we don't think it's necessary for us to, you know, to report to investors about the, uh, the risk that our company faces due to climate change. And, um, it, it takes the smaller investors typically sure. to be the ones that say, uh, okay, if you're not going to just sort of do that, you know, we'll engage with you to see if you're, you know, and talk about the issue, but if you're not going to agree to do it, then we're going to file a shareholder resolution and it's going to be a public debate at your shareholder meeting. And um, it typically takes the more focused, you know, smaller ESG asset managers to, to, to be the sponsors along with, along with large pension plans typically right. would do it and, or, or other institutional investors. But the, the, the thing is, um, these things come to a vote and this year at Exxon, a majority of their shareholders voted to ask, to ask Exxon to report on climate change risk uh, on an annual basis to investors. And the biggest investors, BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, all voted in favor of that. But had it not been you know, a shareholder resolution in the first place, yeah. that never would have happened. Right. And so I, it, it plays a really important role, I think, to, yep. for the smaller um, asset managers to, to be willing to step out and, and sponsor and co-sponsor right. shareholder resolutions. Yep on these kinds of issues. Matt, you mentioned uh, protections for the transgender community are uh, high on your list. Um, what else in those conversations with management uh, do you think are really important uh, for, for them to be focused on today? Uh, well, climate change in general and addressing it is important and we, we're finding that certainly most companies have um, an, uh, you know, a, an understanding of, its, of the way it's going to impact them and are trying to address it in their business model. So, um, it's, it's generally understood. We, we obviously um, are in need of more policy support in order to get to where we need to go on addressing climate risk. Um, in, the, you know, in the issue areas where I find that companies need to spend more attention, um, gender equality is one that we've found that they understand there is a problem and we've been um, frustrated by the lack of transparency about where they are in trying to address it. And to just sort of give a, um, an example of sort of an industry with a problem, we know the financial services industry broadly has an issue. I, I was talking to a group of 100 C-suite executives from the financial services industry about gender pay equality, asking how many of them had addressed it and felt they had achieved equality of gender pay um, in their firms, and only four out of 100 raised their hands. That means 96 think they have a problem, and that's a big issue that needs to be addressed. And yet, when we go to them to say we want to understand where you are and what you're doing to address it, um, that to generally say we have no interest in being transparent about what, we're, what our internal HR um, profile looks like in terms of gender pay equality. And it's you know, pretty simple to run, pretty simple to look at, um, particularly the larger the employee population. But so that, you know, there's, a, there's an issue area that 
may not come to light as a risk factor in the current administration in Washington, but it will come back as a risk factor should the administration change in Washington. And we were moving in a direction, and I'm not sure if people are familiar, Department of Labor had just issued guidelines that starting in 2018, compensation would be re released as or turned in as part of the EEO-1 form annually, along with gender, race, ethnicity. That would have made it incredibly transparent to the Department of Labor, whether you had a gender pay equality issue or a race equality pay issue. And, uh, and that, has, that is on hold by the current administration. But, so, but just sort of issue areas that I think are really relevant and important as we go forward. Yeah. We've been talking a lot about stocks, uh, you know, investing yeah. in stocks, but that's only going to be a small part of your financial life, uh, or you know, depending on your portfolio, maybe a big part, but maybe not something you're thinking about every day. Uh, Matt, what else can you do uh, in terms of your financial life uh, to help support the LGBT community? Is there uh, banks that maybe are better to, to have your dollars at? Uh, do things like that make a difference? Well, um, I mean, yes, and, and certainly trying to make sure you're keeping your money local just in a starting point. And if you happen to be in a, a community with a community bank that is, uh, is um, supportive of the LGBT community, I mean, we happen to have had uh, um, in, in Boston, Wainwright Bank, which, which for years was, um, did a lot of outreach to the community and did a lot of lending to the community. And um, it's now part of Eastern Bank, but Eastern Bank has still continued that tradition. So um, we, we, we are, uh, we're able to keep our money local and keep our, our, our dollars in, in the community. But um, the mistake I think people have made is not only have they moved their investment portfolios broadly to where they have no idea where their money is or what impacts it's having. They've done that with their bank deposits, mm -hmm. right? I put my money in a big, large national bank and I have no idea the impacts my money is at, or the money, you know, where, where the money's going or what impacts the, the money is having. So I, I think there is opportunity for, for the, you know, in cash deposits, there's plenty of community loan funds, and many of the community loan funds have also had loan funds that are targeted toward the LGBT community. Um, so um, lots of opportunity. Yeah. And there's you know, even an LGBT venture fund platform. So if you want to support with some of your private capital LGBT entrepreneurs, there is an online platform to do that. And, there, and just the, the term is called is CDFI for Community Development Financial Institution. It's fairly easy to find, you know, lists of, of those yep. institutions out there and, and how you can invest in them. It's fairly uh, fairly straightforward way to invest uh, your your cash holdings as well as some of them being community banks that you can put deposits in. John, if you're a DIY investor. Um, you know, you say narrow it down, you said, okay, I definitely want a, a sustainable fund, you know, I care about the impact. You still have a lot of choices out there, uh, you know, some are better than others. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's the best way to start making sense of um, how to pick the one that, that's right for you? Well, a couple of things I, I guess I would, would point out. The first thing that you, you can do, and it's something that we have here at Morningstar, we have a, we have a, um, a system for evaluating portfolios, particularly equity fund portfolios, on the basis of how well the underlying holdings in those portfolios are doing on sustainability issues, ESG issues, broadly speaking. And um, so virtually every fund out there has a, what we call a globe rating that, that indicates how well it's doing on that. So that's one way to look at you know, the, what you currently may own to see you know, well, how's the fund, you know, how's my fund doing on this? I, you know, there's, there's, until really we've done this, there really hasn't been any way to, to do that. So that's a good first check on your existing portfolio. Or, you know, if someone is, if you have an advisor that's recommending a set of funds for you, that's a, that's a good, um, you know, good element to, to look at as an, as an initial um, screen. Uh, the other thing is you can, you know, find the, the, the list of, 
ESG-oriented funds that have it really as a as 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 Matt and Trillium do have a have it as you know this is really part of what we do as part of our DNA and you can you know actually you can use the Morningstar Globe ratings as a kind of a check there too because in most cases those sort of funds do very well on our uh, sustainability rating. So you know that's a I think it's a it's a good way to start and then um, you know obviously. Uh, you know, mutual fund level, you got to look at some of the standard things surrounding performance and that you would potentially look at for any fund. So, you know, the past, the past performance record, what, it, what kind of, uh, uh, you know, what's, what area of the market does this fund cover, um, you know, its expenses, things like that are all relevant here as well. Yep. I was going to say the other myth I think people get into is thinking they have they don't have enough money to invest in this way and therefore they don't bother and it's like I um, how many of you in the room have a retirement plan a 401k plan 403b um, and there are fund choices right and so it is uh, an opportunity is to be thinking well where is that money invested and to be uh, thoughtful about pressing your company to add options that are sustainable if they don't have them but odds are they do have some sustainable options, and um, and and you know, have you really looked at them? I, I was uh, absolutely shocked when my my sister is a CPA. She had worked 30 years at an insurance company, recently laid off, called me, and said, "I need to do something about rolling over my 401k." And I said, "Well, where is it invested?" And she said, "I don't know. I don't know." And when I finally got it, it was all in target date funds. And I was like, well, you know, how did you end up in all target date funds? That was the default. Okay. So a little more conscious about what we're doing and what impacts we're having is, is all we're saying. That's why people should start off by <coughs> saying, what impacts am I having in the world? Because we tend to spend more time deciding whether or not we buy the organic avocado than we do on where our money is invested. And that's really crazy. <laughs> Right when you talk about the global impacts we're having, so it might be a little bit well, more work, but it's worth it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a, and there is a connection there, right? right Between the, right. The, 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 what we're seeing in, in 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 consumer surveys and so forth is that increasingly, as people get more and more comfortable as consumers making right. those kinds of decisions, right. Right. Um, <laughs> that they're more comfortable extending that into the investing realm as well. And so I, I think we're gonna see a, 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 a continued real increase in, in uh, the amount of, of uh, money invested this way. Okay. Um, the other thing I would say, I would add about uh, your DC plan. Um, you know, typically DC plans are- Which would be like a 401k. 401, 401, 401 defined contribution, so 401k, 403b. Um, you know, typically the, those who are administering that plan for you are, you know, pretty responsive to employee requests and re employee concerns about the uh, the investment lineup that's in that plan. So, um, if your plan doesn't have a you know a sustainable ESG um, option in it, it's certainly worth uh, ask you know getting together with maybe some like-minded folks and, and asking uh, the the folks who run the plan to take a look there because in our experience we've you know we found that that people can be pretty responsive to that John that's a brings up a good point there's a lot of people here who are in the financial services industry maybe are either producing or selling some of the products we're talking about um, if they go back to their office tomorrow what can they do um, to, to have more of an impact is it a change in marketing campaigns is it adding a sustainable plan uh, uh, fund excuse me to their 401k plan what what are some of the action items people yeah can well I mean I think that's a that, that's an important one I, we, there's so much interest out there in general particularly in this type of investing particularly among Millennials particularly among women um, that if DC plans had options uh, in them uh, to invest this way, I think they would start getting a lot more assets in them and allow people to start investing that way. And as they amass 
you know, wealth over time to the point where they're, you know, going to an advisor and they have more to invest and they'll already be, you know, used to investing this way rather than defaulting into a, a target date fund. Certainly from a product development standpoint, I mean, it's, it's, this is way easier said than done, but there, there, there does need to be um, uh, target date oriented funds that are ESG oriented. Right. That would be a great idea. And the Tixus is, has uh, a, a company called Natixis has just launched a target date series earlier this year, but it'll take it a while, you know, before it uh, develops a three-year, at least a three-year track record. Most uh, um, gatekeepers will be hesitant to include it until at least right. that time, but right. it's a good idea because yeah. uh, so many of DC plans are dominated now by um, target date And those uh, funds. target date funds are, you know, if you ever see that, you know, target retirement 2045 and it, gets usually more conservative, I hope it gets more conservative over time, yeah. uh, the mix between stocks and bonds yeah. and cash. I mean, they're, they're, really a, stop shop. Yeah. Yeah, they're really a great way to invest in some ways if you're just, if all you want to do is check a box and, and be done with it, and it, it gives you the uh, stock bond combination that's the most appropriate to your sort of time till retirement, but um, yeah, it'd be nice to have some ESG oriented options in that area. You mentioned an advisor a minute ago. Um, you know, we talk to a lot of advisors um, here who, who use our products, and we sometimes hear, I have a client who comes to me, they're interested in sustainability, I don't know what to tell them. If you go to your advisor and you say, hey, I want to have impact, and they say, um, I don't know, or you are looking for a new advisor or shopping for an advisor, what are some of the questions that you would ask to see if they're on, on the right track? Yeah, yeah. Despite the growth and the fact that impact investing is now available in almost every major platform, right? There is very few uh, broker dealer platforms or investment advisors you can go to who don't have an option right now um, available to them. You will still get, for the majority of financial consultants you go to, you shouldn't do that. That'll be the, the canned answer. And the, the reason, in my view, and this is an opinion, is that the majority of people don't want to do the extra work <laughs> to look at what that would mean for how they would change the portfolio. I, I, I had this conversation with somebody from Cambridge Associates, and they said, look, we have our solution set for our clients. What you're suggesting is that all the stuff we've done should be redone, and it probably should be redone for every client based on what they really care about. And I don't want to do that much work, period. And I was like, OK. So inertia and, la and human laziness <laughs> is probably the biggest single impediment we have to people actually looking at the impacts their money has. And I, you know, but anyway, I, so I throw that out. I think you really have to go in and basically say, this is a condition of you keeping my money or you having me as a client, you know, winning my business, is I need to know that you are going to help me invest this in alignment with my values, period. And they will learn if it means <laughs> that that's what they need to do to get the business or keep the business. And is it, there a good way to kind of tease out if they're paying lip service to it or if your portfolio actually, if they're actually out there making those phone calls? Uh, Sustainable globes. <laughs> look, at the, look at the ratings, because there is a way of seeing through um, on the fun side to whether with, with the Morningstar ratings, to be able to look through and see, you know how they measure up relative to each other, and so because you know there certainly are. I mean, I don't, <laughs> there's lots of product out there. It, it's it's a different quality when it comes to sustainability, and you really do need to try to understand the underlying holdings and approach. We're yep. in about 15 minutes. I think we might start yep. circling around to take some questions. Um, but just in the term, oh, I'm sorry, John. I was just going to point out this graphic behind yep. us, but please. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, agree, advisors are a big pinch point. And, um, you know, going and showing them that there's, uh, that there's real demand and interest out there is, is the most effective thing. And if an advisor looks at you with sort of glazed eyes or tries to say, or look, or with fear, like, oh my God, I'm going to have to have a odd conversation that's out of my normal, you know, comfort zone, which is what, really what they don't want to see happen because they want to be the experts in the room. 
Um, it, it, that can really, though, move them because we, we interact with advisors a lot. In fact, we have a next year an advisory education program that we're launching to on ESG so that advisors have a feel for how to do it. Um, and, but but in, in talking to them now, I mean, that's the main thing. Is that they, can, they just get you know, one or two you know, pretty good-sized clients, especially, if, if that's the case, um, asking them about it and them not being able to, to respond uh, uh, appropriately to get their attention. Um, yeah. I just had this this past summer I, at, at our it's a Saturday morning I'm sitting there at our at our house and uh, the do, knock on the door and uh, it's my doctor you know I mean on Saturday morning I'm like well, you know what, what? And my wife's like well, our doctor's here he wants to, he says he wants to talk to you he, I mean he lives I know he lives he lives nearby and we're you know, some we're friendly and everything, but you know, I'm still a little nervous coming to the door on Saturday morning with my doctors. And it, it, I was, it was so funny because he has this set of papers with him. We sit down on our front porch, and he says, "I've been reading about your sustainability rating, and I went to my advisor yesterday and asked him about this, and he had no idea what I was talking about. But you know, he said since it was Morningstar, he said he would go back and and you know take a look, but but." Um, you know, it got us into this whole conversation, and it ended up with him saying, you know, geez, you know, maybe my advisor doesn't get me. And um, so that's, you know, he, he, th this advisor, this is a doctor, you know, he, right. he, he was about to lose that business and ultimately did because he, he had no idea about this. So more and more advisors th th have that experience. I think we're going to alleviate that pinch point a bit. Yeah, yeah. And there are advisors who get it. Right, so that is very true, right? There's, I, I mean, it's a great opportunity. So it's, a, and so it's it's those who those who do understand it and are able to talk that language of, um, and I you know I've had the conversation with many advisors. I'm like, you know your clients' values. You watch who they gift stock to annually. You know the organizations they give to. You know if they're giving to Greenpeace, I'll bet they care about environmental yeah. issues. Yeah. I mean, just guessing, but yeah. You know, <laughs> well, and, 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 my, my, doc, so. my doctor's um, yeah. practice is called the Green Medical Practice, yeah. and his name is not Doctor Green. Yep, yep. You know, <laughs> I mean, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, it's like with that information, you can have a much greater relationship with that client and multi generational because you're understanding the family and the value system. Yeah. And, and it's it, for advisors. Um, it's a it's a great opportunity right yeah. now for an advisor to to really establish a, that kind of um, expertise in their practice right now, given the level of interest uh, out there and the and this advisor pinch point. I do just want to point out the graph we have here, just um, about those you know ESG issues and. Here just uh, this is from a report uh, that uh, Trillium uh, put together on investing uh, in equality, which is uh, we have a few paper copies of, and I think we're going to email out a link to as well. Um, but go through some of this in, in more detail. But you know, just kind of how many different type of issues intersect uh, quite literally here, but right, that you right. can't care about just one, mm -hmm. um, and it kind of comes back to that that holistic report. Yep. Um, yep. I don't know if there's any questions. Uh, if you have any questions, raise your hand. We are ready. I would just say, as we're grabbing the question, that it's a, it's a. I recommend the the paper that that Jeremy just mentioned, and it's actually a good thing to potentially take to an advisor if uh, if you are interested. So, thank you so much. This has been very helpful. I'm an advisor, and we are making a pretty big push into impact investing. But one of the concerns that I have it's. It's funny you mentioned Cambridge. We have a private family foundation, and that's their consultant. And one of the funds that we manage for them is all fossil fuels. So in the last meeting, we talked about that, and they said the board would like to go in a more green direction because all they do is charity. And we had the conversation about what's more important, to make more money to do more good or to make money in a way that doesn't destroy the planet. Mm -hmm. And it was very easy to make that transition and make a recommendation. But when I'm speaking to everyday investors, I'm always concerned about making sure that they retire. Yep. So it's finding that, and, I, and hopefully you can give me some insight, um, because the entry point is a pretty high dollar value to be properly allocated in a yep. holistically impactful way. 
how do you balance that? Do you recommend just easing into it? And so that's my first question. Yeah. My second question is, when considering allocation, what kind of progress are we making in spaces outside of the US and Europe, like emerging markets, which is an important part of a portfolio? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, I'll take the last, I mean, just answer that last question first, right? In emerging markets, it is absolutely more complicated, and there's a lot less opportunity um, to, if, you know, in holding the same standards we try to for the developed world. And so we end up um, usually with a smaller option of companies that are usually much larger in the emerging markets, which is not getting you the same exposure. And so there is, a, there is still a problem in the emerging markets. But uh, broadly, um, you know, Trillium has, uh, and for, for our clients, we have a $2 million minimum, right, which is very high. And we recognize most people can't do that, so we started trying to take what we do and make it available in a mutual fund form and through partnerships so that people could access the strategies at much lower dollar amounts. And so we're on platform now with over 150,000 financial advisors. We're probably available through you, I don't know, but we probably are because we're, we're, we seem, I mean, I'm amazed at how many people have access um, through the different platforms. And the access point can be as low as $50,000. Right, with with uh, separately managed accounts, and as low as obviously two thousand with a mutual fund. And John Hancock is our last partner, distribution partner. We picked up. Um, they've been taking our product and putting it in a mutual fund form. So um, I think there's a lot more available. That is very. That it really is deep and have an impactful. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know the. The other thing that's happening is there's a lot of stuff that's a little more superficial that's come out, and I think it's trying to navigate that. That's the problem for the financial advisor, and I, I don't envy that process because there's so much coming at um, the financial advisor in terms of product, um, and it's usually trying to target. I mean, a lot of it is targeting a theme. You know, I see people talk about divestment. Okay, we'll have the fossil fuel free index fund, and it's like. Okay, but your your own Halliburton, I don't understand, you know. And you know, and then you look and you're like, I don't, you know. And you own a refinery. Oh no, you own the same percentage in fossil fuels as the underlying index. How are you fossil fuel free? Well, they, that's how they defined it, right? And it's like there, and so there's lots of lots of things to navigate. But um, I do think there's a lot more um, available and. Um, as far as the, you know, meeting their financial needs, I agree with you, that's a real high priority. And so you have to then look at how much you do in privates that could be longer term and not as liquid. And you probably can't do, you know, very much of that for the client who doesn't have significant assets. Yeah, and I, would, I mean, the only thing I would add to that is that, I mean, just to underscore, you, you said it, but you don't need $2 million to get a, right. <laughs> a diversified portfolio that's, that's sustainable. Um, that um, when you think about performance, you know, if, if you have a broadly diversified asset allocation. I put up your uh, slide, Jim. Yeah, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> that, you know, performance really shouldn't be a, a, that much of an issue, you know, fund by fund, because for the most part, these types of funds do as well as conventional funds, if not a little better. I think this, I think what this is showing is that, making that point, the blue bars are the um, sustainable funds and the, the uh, purple are the overall universe and it's sort of skewed to funds that have done, the, the sustainable funds are skewed to the positive side of things. It's, I, I've been checking this out um, for like the last decade and a half and it's always been the case. So, you know, it, the performance of the individual funds are pretty competitive and then, you know, for the most part, the overall performance of a broadly asset allocated portfolio has to do more with asset allocation than it does the, the fund selection. So, um, in, in a lot of ways, not a huge, not a huge issue there. But the other uh, point I was gonna make is that I see a lot of uh, advisors really just kind of trying to mirror the asset allocation as best they can with a smaller amount and growing into it 
over time as the probably the most um, predominant strategy to working someone into a to a sustainable portfolio that already has a kind of conventional one in, in place. Other questions? You got a few more? Okay. I was wondering if you could explain this slide a little bit more with the five star and the one star. I'm not sure everybody understands that and, and how those funds have played out. Sure. So this is um, uh, a slide of, okay, I think, see if I can remember it so I don't have to look around. Um, the, uh, so the, the Morningstar star ratings are a, a measure of risk adjusted performance. So they're looking backwards at recent performance, right, of a fund. It could be, for any individual fund, it could be, it's at least their last three years of record, but it includes up to 10 years if the fund is that old. So um, it's your risk adjusted performance relative to your category. So a similar kind of fund, if it's a large cap growth fund, you're compared with other large cap growth funds. So normally, you know, in a sort of, it, on average, or the, the normal way that we distribute the star ratings is that the only 10% get five stars, another like 22 and a half get four stars, so your top third are in the fives and the fours. Your middle third is a three star, it gets three stars, and your bottom third get two or one star. And so that's, that normal distribution is the purple, um, bars here showing on average this is what funds, how funds star ratings stack up. The blue bars are the sustainable funds, most recent star ratings. So there's more sustainable funds that have four stars than you would expect on average. There's more that have three stars. There's slightly less that have five stars, um, but there's also less that have two and one star. So you're getting, you know, at least average to slightly above average performance, you know, on average with, with sustainable funds. So certainly this idea that's, that's been, you know, out there and we've had to kind of, um, you know, argue against for a long time has been that, well, this type of investing underperforms and we just don't see that kind of evidence in the, in the performance of, the, of actual funds. Yeah, I just want to say that um, I do like these ETFs, and I appreciate how you have them um, out there, or at least they exist for people who have uh, lower assets that can are interested in this. Um, I want to ask, though, do you have like a report that you publish on companies that um, already do or like are part of these funds already, so uh, people could purchase like individual stocks, um, like uh, just on their own, so that they could. Uh, be interested and like build speak, their own can you speak can you speak up a little bit I can't I couldn't quite get that last part yeah like <laughs> just I'm curious if you publish a report um, for the companies that um, have these values and if they're publicly out there and available so the individual could buy um, each of them mm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's an interesting it's a good question so um, to, for us to get our information we use a, a firm called sustainalytics which is a ESG research firm that does all this company level um, evaluations uh, that we use in our fund level um, sustainability ratings. Those, that research is largely available only to asset managers at a fairly high price, frankly. Um, and we're currently, I would say, I, I the way I would put it is we're working with uh, Sustainalytics to be able to do a better job of being able to um, surface that for investors, at least some parts of it. So next year, for instance, we, at least on our, on our drawing board for next year, um, uh, is um, a list of you know, sustainability leaders that also in Morningstar parlance are uh, funds with uh, moats or strong competitive advantages and that are, fair, you know, are uh, selling for below their fair value. So w we're gonna be, uh, coming out with more of that information. Right now, I would say, frankly, it's fairly hard. Don't you think, Matt? Well, I mean, I'm going to give you a way that my, the industry might not, including uh, my colleagues at, at Trillium, yeah. might not want oh, well, yeah, <laughs> being I know what you're done. Saying, but yeah. I'm going to say, yeah, you can go ahead and look at the sustainability ratings and then get a, a, the, the ones that score well and go and notice the overlap of which names they all hold because they're going to score really well on uh, sustainability. And yeah. so... You know, it's the holdings of mutual funds is public. So going 
back, you know, sort of just simply trying to look at, well, what does, you know, what are the names that happen to be in common with, you know, these 10 funds that I've identified that I like uh, that have high sustainability ratings and talk about LGBT equality as part of their process, what do they hold that's in common? They're probably going to be ones that score really well, right? And so those are going to be companies you're going to be comfortable owning the individual stock. So. I think that's all the time we have. I think Chris has a quick. Uh... Can we, Jeremy? Can we get one more? We oh, already, I'm sorry. Okay. We already we'll handed out. Please, one more in. Yep. Sorry. Hi. Um, thanks very much for the presentation. I think you made a really good case of illustrating how an investor who cares about LGBT issues can access that part of the market. Uh, my bigger question is more on how we can make that impact on a broader scale. So we've seen this huge reallocation of, fund, of um, investment from active to passive funds that are just, you know, kind of <coughs> following indices. And we've seen the S&P 500 recently exclude SNAP due to kind of voting rights issues. And Saudi Aramco didn't list on London for similar reasons where they would be excluded from the FTSE. Do you think that the index providers, um, and, and not just special indices, but things like broad market, S&P 500, will eventually take LGBT and you know, other social factors into consideration in their standards? If I can give a quick plug for an uh, interview we did with uh, Vanguard founder uh, Jack Bogle last week. Um, so he obviously is the father of index investing in a lot of ways. And he makes the case that index investors in a lot of ways um, are good for corporate governance because of their permanence. Um, you know, that because they potentially have very long relationships with management, management knows they're not going anywhere, that if they're going to be a thorn in their side, they're going to continue to be a thorn in their side. Uh, and that uh, potentially indexes in, in that way could um, still promote good uh, ESG values if the um, you know, kind of asset manager itself is, is interested in it and, and can really push it. I know we've seen from Vanguard and from BlackRock and others that that's become more important. Um, so he made that case, um, and sorry, I'll let you guys. Uh, no, I, I, I too, think that's but, yeah. true that we're seeing a, a more activist role from some of the players who are doing some of these large index funds, which is helpful for moving in the right direction. There's also been a move by some of the global stock exchanges to start mm -hmm. to up the standards of environmental, social, um, certainly disclosure and, and, and setting standards. So mm -hmm. ultimately, um, it, it certainly could move in the direction of there being a higher level of standards to get into the S&P 500, which would make a difference. But we're certainly not anywhere near where we need to be um, to be able to say the S&P 500 is looking to make sure that there's, you know, uh, uh, an environmental or social standard in order to be in the in the index. Agree. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Uh, All right, everybody. Please give a round of applause to Matthew, John, and Jeremy for joining us this evening. Also to everybody who helped make this event possible. Um, we're not finished. We have an after reception on the opposite end. Please join us. And uh, thank you to everyone for joining us this evening.